Okay, I think we have a quorum, so I will um, I will get started. And I'll do that by saying good morning to all of you from wherever you're joining us. Uh, this is the second of our two APSG meetings this June. It's a little afternoon here in Overcast, Washington. If there are, in fact, any of you who haven't met me, I'm Jim Finkel. I'm one of the co-founders of the Atrocity Prevention Study Group, and I'm the person that organizes our, our monthly meetings. I want to welcome all of you to today's discussion of the crime of aggression protected points and the challenges of citizen evidence collection. I want to note that we will be recording today's initial presentations with our presenters' permission, and that we will later be posting that recording on the Stimson Center's APSG page. We will not be recording any part of the Q&A part of our meeting. I'd also like to remind everyone as we get started that all of our discussion will be unclassified. During the Q&A part of our meetings, we'll be operating under Chatham House rules. You may take notes, but you should not refer to individuals by name. Some of you may have noted that we've added a list of recent books and articles that we think might be of interest to our invitation and registration form. I've specifically done that in response to requests from some of our government colleagues. If you come across books and articles in the future that you would like me to flag, uh, please let me know. I want to turn now to introducing our presenters, uh, Professor Federica D'Alessandra and Kristen Smith. Federica is Deputy Director of Oxford University's Institute for Ethics, Law, and Armed Conflict and Executive Director of the Program on International Peace and Security at the Blavatnik School of Government. Prolific writer, she's also an academic affiliate of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and a member of the steering committee of the Oxford Network of Peace Studies. Prior to joining uh, Oxford, Federica had various appointments at Harvard, including the JFA, JFK School and the Harvard Law School, where she focused on mass atrocity response and prevention transitional justice, national security, and human rights, and also served as an advisor to the Harvard Sustainable Peace Initiative. Her current research interests include international law, foreign policy, global governance, and leadership studies. Turning to Kristen, Kristen is the director of the American Bar Association's Atrocities Crimes Initiative. It's a group of projects, including the International Criminal Court Project, focused on atrocity prevention, response and accountability, and jointly supported by ABA's Criminal Justice Section and the Center for Human Rights. She also serves as a staff attorney for the ABA's Criminal Justice Section. Prior to joining ABA, she worked on issues of gender equality, Reproductive Rights and Justice for Sexual and Gender-Based Crimes as a legal fellow at the Global Justice Center in New York. She also previously supported the Whitney R. Harris World Law Institute's International Research and Education Initiatives as a fellow, including the Crimes Against Humanity Initiative. Before that, worked as a legislative analyst and criminal prosecutor in Oregon. She is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. Welcome to both of you, and thank you again for joining us this morning. For those of you who, who may be wondering, I thought I would add some reflections on some of the challenges of civilian and bilateral evidence collection, mostly focused on the current situation in Ukraine. A couple of additional housekeeping comments. Ilhan Dahir, my colleague at the Stimson Center, will be running today's Zoom call. Ilhan will keep everyone but the person presenting muted. We will hold all questions until our presenters have finished their presentations. To facilitate discussion, I will ask those participants using the video Zoom link to signal me using the raise hand function when they'd like to raise a question or comment. I will take questions and comments in the order that I see you 
Please state your name after I call on you and which of our speakers you'd like to address your question or comment to. For those of you just using the Zoom link audio, please use the chat feature to raise comments or questions. Ilhan will share the questions in the order that they are received. Um, finally, for those of you who are interested, we're making available Zoom's closed captioning capability. However, each of you will have to activate it individually using the icon at the bottom of your screen. And with that, uh, Federica, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jim, uh, for the introduction, of course, for the invitation to be part of this discussion. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, everyone and to share uh, this debate floor with you and, and Kristen. Um, so there's so much that can be said from the perspective of international law in terms of what's happening in Ukraine, uh, but uh, there's also only so much that one can cover in 15 minutes. So what I'll do is I'll focus on what I've uh, explicitly been asked to focus on, which is the international law definition of aggression as both an unlawful state act and as a crime uh, under international law and potential avenues for enforcing criminal um, responsibility, including the potential uh, for ICC intervention and uh, also alternative uh, jurisdictional avenues and the main challenges that might arise from them. And I will conclude my presentation by setting out my own views and policy recommendations, but uh, because the first part of the presentation is a bit of a heavy discussion of the law, I hope you'll bear with me. And I have prepared some slides that I will share now in the hope that they um, will help me or help everybody follow along. However, it looks like I cannot share the slides uh, from my screen. I think you have to make me the co-host for that. Unless Elon wants to put them on and I can just tell you when to move the slides forward. Uh, sorry, give me a moment. I'm giving you the capability. Okay, thank you. I think it should work now. Yes. All right, so I think everybody can see my screen now. Right, okay, so let's um, first start talking about um, aggression as an unlawful state act. The use of armed force by states um, is of course prohibited under international law and aggression refers to the most serious and dangerous forms of the illegal use of force. Uh, the notion of aggression finds its roots, obviously, in uh, interwar developments and legal instruments, including, ironically enough, the 1933 Litvinov Treaty, named after Russia, revolutionary and, and Soviet statesman Maxim Litvinov, which was the first treaty that actually defined substantively what aggression entails. Um, Defining aggression is all, is, has been very controversial among states uh, for uh, a number of political reasons, including, of course, everybody here will know Cold War dynamics and the always latent risk of confrontation between the US and the USSR. And it, at, already at the 1945 San Francisco conference, some countries had attempted to incorporate an international agreement on the meaning of aggression uh, to the UN Charter, but those attempts failed. And ultimately, the Charter indirectly enshrined the prohibition against aggression in Article 2.4, which uh, prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of another state. So uh, the Charter refers to aggression at various stages, but it never actually defines substantively what it means. Rather, it gives ultimate responsibility to determine its existence to uh, the Security Council and, of course, to take action in response, uh, essentially providing a procedural regulatory framework rather than a substantive one. Uh, however, there is today no doubt that the prohibition against state aggression is a parentary norm of international law that gives rise to erga omnes obligations reflective of customary international law. And in fact, any objections that have ever been put forward by states have not been with respect to the existence of the prohibition against aggression as such, but rather um, the scope of the prohibition and what it what should fall under, under it. Um, and uh, it might be worthy of note at the stage that given aggression constitutes a, a breach of a parentary norm, under international law, 
Every state has a legal obligation to cooperate through lawful means to end the breach, not to recognize as lawful uh, any situation resulting from the breach, and also not to assist Russia's aggression, which obviously has bearing both for Belarus' own complicity, but also uh, for any considerations that Beijing might be given about lending Russia uh, material assistance or support uh, for it to sustain its aggressive uh, campaign um, against uh, Ukraine. And I believe Uda. Una Anaway Athaway has written about this in Just Security, so I refer you to that post if, if this is of interest to you. Um, in 1974, the General Assembly, uh, the UN General Assembly, adopted Resolution 3314 on the definition of aggression, again as a state act, pr uh, principally to guide UN Security Council determinations on the matter pursuant to Article 39 of the Charter. The resolution begins with a broad definition of aggression that is drawn largely from Article 2.4, except that it omits uh, threats uh, of the use of force. And uh, so uh, characterizes aggression as the use of force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state or in any other manner that is inconsistent with the charter. If that goes on to enumerate a list of acts, uh, which regardless of a declaration of war shall in accordance with the provisions of Article 2 qualify as an act of aggression. And this is a non-exhaustive list, but I would only mention the ones that are most relevant in this case, which include the invasion or attack by armed forces of a state uh, of the territory of another state or any military occupation, annexation by the use of force, which is of obvious relevance to Crimean Donbass, the bombardment or use of any weapons by a state against the territory of another state, blockade of ports uh, or coast by a state of a state by the armed forces of another state, uh, an attack by the armed forces of a state on the land, sea, air forces, or marine and air fleet of another state. The action of a state in allowing its territory to be used by another state to perpetrate aggression against a third state, which is obviously uh, of relevance to Belarus, and descending by or on behalf of a state of armed bands, groups, irregulars, and mercenaries, which is, of course, relevant to Russia's um, deployment of the infamous uh, Wagner Group, among others. Although the uh, definition contained in this resolution uh, has rarely been used for the purposes that it was designed by the Security Council. It has been referred to by the International Court of Justice in its own considerations of uh, unlawful use of force by states. And in its jurisprudence, the ICJ has recognized that certain provisions of the definition do in fact reflect customary international law, although the, the customary law status of the definition as a whole is controversial. Um, in fact, already during the negotiations for the resolution, states had advanced a number of objections in terms of the scope of the uh, definition, most notably around the issue of blockades, attacks by marine, marine fleets, and the sending of irregular mercenaries. Uh, and many of these objections resurfaced as the international community was then negotiating the uh, Rome Statute of the uh, ICC um, in 1998, and then again in 2010. However, on the basis of both customary and applicable treaty law, I believe that there's no doubt that uh, the bulk of uh, Russia's conduct in Ukraine falls squarely within the definition of aggress aggression as a state act, and it's one of the clearest violations of the prohibition against the lawful use of force that is enshrined in Article 2, uh, 4 of the UN Charter. And uh, although, of course, uh, Russia has uh, deceivingly uh, tried to justify its military operations and its aggression campaign um, uh, on a number of, of grounds that will fall uh, under exceptions um, to the prohibition against the use of force, uh, 141 UN member states have voted to deplore such conduct and have flatly rejected uh, such claims. Now, turning to uh, aggression as an international crime, uh, the first time conduct underpinning state aggression was recognized as a crime under international law, and in fact, the supreme international crime was uh, with the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals uh, after World War II. Aggression was then known as crime, uh, crimes against peace and was defined as the planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, and assurances. The same definition was later enshrined in the so-called Nuremberg Principles that were drawn out by the UN International Law Commission at the request of the General Assembly in, in an attempt to extrapolate general principles uh, of law, international law uh, arising from the uh, tribunal and its judgment. However, um, there's been no prosecution for uh, such conduct since then and until 2010, um, no other international treaty or, or charter or statute uh, at codified aggression as an international crime. Um, when the uh, 
delegates to the Rome Conference in 1998, uh, and, and I see that some of them are, are present here, um, attempted to negotiate a, a definition of the crime of aggression for the purposes of the statute, despite the existence of the 1974 definition of a state act of aggression, they could not reach um, agreement in terms of what would underpin criminal conduct. And um, it took, so the Rome statute at that point just kind of punted the, uh, the issue in Article 5.2. And then it took additional 12 years of negotiations uh, for states to agree to a definition of aggression as a crime for the purposes of the statute. And this was finally achieved in uh, 2010 with the Kampala Amendment on Aggression, which uh, defines the crime of aggression in what is now uh, Article 8 bis as the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a state by a person in a position effectively to control, to exercise control over or to direct the political and military action of a state of an act of aggression, which by its character, gravity and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the UN Charter. In paragraph uh, two, um, Article 8 bis goes on to list a series of acts of aggression that having met the requisite gravity threshold would then underpin uh, the crime of aggression. And, and this draws directly from resolution 33, 3314, so I'm just not going to repeat that. Um, but a few things seem important to note at the substantive level. First is this gravity threshold that the Rome Statute introduces between and differentiation between aggression as a state act and aggression as a crime. So the Rome Statute uh, does not criminalize all states of, uh, acts of aggression, but only those that by their character, gravity, and scale constitute a manifest, manifest violation of the charter. And um, how this is going to be evaluated, I think it's still not completely clear. Uh, not dissimilarly to the definition of aggression as a state act, most of the objections to states um, or delegates to Rome Conference and then to Kampala Conference and interim negotiations advance did not concern the core um, um, of the definition of aggression, but rather uh, whether the scope of the definition, meaning whether certain um, acts or conducts uh, would have to be captured under the scope of the definition. And I think that one of the most salient conversations were around, was around the issue of humanitarian intervention, but uh, there's also some healthy debate going on around the deployment of uh, offensive cyber capabilities that I think would deserve its own presentation, but I'm happy to uh, chat over a bit during the Q&A if that's of interest. The second thing to note at the substantive level is that under the Rome Statute, uh, the crime of aggression is a leadership crime, meaning that it can only be committed by persons in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state. And from this perspective, so first of all, uh, it has been uh, noted that this appears to be a, a standard that is narrower uh, than that uh, provided by in customary international law and even of the precedents that were set in Nuremberg. And I think it's it's worthwhile to know that those that have um, advocated or are advocating for the establishment of an aggression tribunal, which I will cover in a minute, have in fact used um, wording that is reminiscing of uh, the Nuremberg precedents and that they are asking to hold accountable those who have materially contributed to or shape the commission of aggression. And there are two precedents in particular from the Nuremberg trials that are worth mentioning. One is that uh, of uh, the conviction of Karl Dunitz for uh, waging aggressive war, even though the uh, tribunal have found that he was not privy to uh, the conspiracy to wage uh, aggression um, as such. And also despite the fact that they had found that he did not have control of the overall military campaign prior to 1943. The other precedent that I think is interesting from this perspective is that of the IG Farben case that recognizes essentially the criminal liability for aggression could attach not just to um, individuals in uh, uh, the political or military apparatus, but also to um, individuals in the industrial field. And how and whether these precedents are going to be applied remains to be seen, but I do think this is a space to watch. And it's also worth noting that um, under Ukrainian criminal law, which uh, criminalizes aggression in Article 437, uh, aggression is not a leadership crime. Now, uh, beyond the substantive definition of aggression under the Rome Statute, um, it is important to underscore that, at least at this stage, and in my opinion, possibly ever, uh, the court will not be able to exercise jurisdiction over Russia's aggression. And that's for a number of reasons. First, because of just how controversial um, aggression has been um, historically, 
states uh, carved out a specific um, and quite frankly, very stringent jurisdictional regime for the crime of aggression that is separate from that of other uh, core crimes, meaning war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide under the statute. Uh, an example of this is the fact that if the International Criminal Court prosecutor wants to exercise its proprio motu powers, um, it has to first notify the Security Council and only after six months, if the Security Council has not made a determination on the existence of aggression, only then the, uh, the uh, prosecutor can seek the pretrial uh, chamber's authorization to proceed with investigations. Uh, something else to note is the fact that um, the court can very explicitly uh, exercise jurisdiction over aggression only um, for aggression that is committed by a state party. So uh, the statute very uh, deliberately and explicitly excludes the court's jurisdiction for non-state parties. And also, uh, so meaning that the court essentially can investigate um, aggression by a state party, not against a state party. And there's also all sorts of other limitations, including the fact that uh, it could only do so after 12 months from uh, the state in question's uh, ratification of the Kampal Amendment, or the fact that um, our Article 15 bis 4 uh, has a card out option uh, from the aggression jurisdictional regime, meaning that even if a state ratifies the Kampal Amendment, it can then object to the court's ex exercise of jurisdiction over the crime of aggression um, essentially uh, excluding itself from such scrutiny. And um, um, the another thing I think uh, that is important to note is the fact that when the activation of the court's jurisdiction of aggression was um, achieved in um, after the 30 ratifications in 2017 and then the uh, consensus resolution by the ASP in 2018, paragraph two of that activation resolution essentially seems to restrict even more uh, the standard for the exercise of jurisdiction in that it essentially entails the states not only need to opt out, but actually they need to opt in. So they have to um, positively agree to the court's um, um, exercise of jurisdiction over aggression after, again, the ratification of the Kampala Amendment and 12 months that have passed. Um, so at this stage, obviously, neither Ukraine or Russia are uh, parties to the Rome Statute. Uh, so that seems uh, that excludes the court's ability. Uh, and even if they were, um, uh, and even if they were to uh, ratify the Kampal Amendment, this would have not have retroactive jurisdiction uh, or a retroactive application. And also it is worth to note that um, with respect to, for example, uh, the lodging of Article 2.3 declaration um, by a non-state party accepting the jurisdiction of the court, which Ukraine has lodged with the ICC, this done, does not cover the crime of aggression. So the court in, in Ukraine can only investigate war crimes, crimes against humanity and, and genocide. And because the lodging of such a declaration does not make Ukraine a state party, um, that's part of the reason why the court cannot exercise uh, jurisdiction over aggression or could not do so in the future. Um, so, and then of course there is the possibility of security council referral, but that's just not going to happen and we all know why. And it has been suggested that the assembly of state parties could amend the Rome statute to add a provision allowing the courts to exercise jurisdiction to be triggered uh, through a referral by the uh, general assembly. But I don't see that as a particularly viable option for two reasons. One is because I doubt that the uh, general assembly has such uh, coercive powers. And two, because this will require a person to the Rome statute ratification of such an amendment by two thirds of ICC state parties followed by a seven eight uh, or a consensus vote by the ASP, which I think it's politically unfeasible at this stage at least. Um, so what are the alternatives uh, to the exercise of or to enforce criminal liability for Russia's aggression? Currently, it seems that there are three pathways uh, currently uh, on the table. One is the establishment of a ad hoc international aggression tribunal, um, which is what has been proposed, for example, by the li likes of uh, Gordon Brown and Philip, Philip Sands and others at Chatham House. Um, the option two would be the establishment of an internationalized tribunal. And there's two versions of this uh, solution. One would be, uh, which we can call option 2A, would be a, a tribunal based on the pool uh, universal jurisdiction uh, model, meaning that those 
20 or so states that have passed universal um, uh, jurisdiction legislation could pull their jurisdiction to create and confer um, um, uh, such jurisdiction to an internationalized court. And the other uh, option is option, we can call it option 2B, which is the one that is preferred by Ukraine, uh, would essentially be a tribunal uh, based on Ukraine's consent, grounded in its own territorial jurisdiction as the affected state, and, and either of these two solutions would benefit of bolstering by a UN General Assembly resolution, uh, uh, the likes of the Cambodia uh, president with the extraordinary courts um, uh, cha uh, chamber in the courts of Cambodia. And uh, these would essentially be a statement of will by the international community of state. There's also the possibility of domestic trials. And in fact, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian and Bel Belarusian um, criminal codes all criminalize aggression. Uh, but there is a limitation to what this can be achieved. Although it is worthy of note that at least in the context of Ukraine, there is some precedent in that Ukraine has in fact uh, convicted uh, members of the uh, Russian armed forces for their participation in the ranks of the um, Luhansk People Republic in 2015. Uh, but again, it seems that this would only apply to lower level perpetrators and I'll explain why. So none of these options are perfect uh, or ideal, and there's um, policy considerations and drawbacks to all of them. Um, I'll cover them in, in turn. So with respect to option A, the ad hoc international uh, tribunal for aggression, uh, first, as I mentioned, I think there's questionable, uh, it's questionable whether the UNGA has authority to create or even to compel uh, to create such a tribunal um, because it does not have uh, equivalent coercive authority uh, as that to the Security Council person to chapter seven. And so for the same reason, it wouldn't also be able to compel suspects before this tribunal. And it is in fact for this particular reason that when Security Council action was blocked around Syria, rather than create a tribunal for Syria, they create a non-coercive investigative mechanism, the IIIM. Uh, there's also uh, concerns around as astronomical cost and, and the financial drain that the establishment of another international tribunal uh, could cause, including the risk of starving or detracting resources by the ICC. Uh, there is concerns that have been expressed about the possibility of a fragmentation of the international justice architecture, meaning that um, you know, some experts are asking, why are we creating a new institution to do what the ICC has built within its system to do, even acknowledging all of these limitations that I've covered. And then of course there is um, the risk of a selectivity uh, or accusations and, and double standards accusations. And of course, I don't have to tell this group that uh, the 2003 US led invasion of Iraq would be in my opinion, one of the biggest obstacles to achieving UNGA support uh, for such a, such a tribunal. Um, with respect to the second bucket of options, internationalized tribunal, tribunals, um, the obstacles, so for option 2A, which is a tribunal based on the pool jurisdiction of states, um, there, I think the main concern, two of the main concerns there would be that one, it seems that pulling the jurisdiction of 20 uh, states for something as grave and as controversial as the crime of aggression, uh, will probably not be enough of a critical mass to um, be met with the support of the international com community of states. Um, and another problem, of course, that arises in this case, and also would also arise in the context of option 2B, uh, which is a tribunal based on the uh, Ukrainian consent and its territorial jurisdiction would be that of immunities. Because essentially, either version of the solution would be anchored and grounded on the domestic jurisdiction of one or multiple states. And so uh, the issue of immunities uh, would become an obstacle. And some, like Dannenbaum, have stated that uh, this issue, well, seems to be overstated, but I do believe that it is uh, in fact um, a significant obstacle. Um, and, and then with respect to uh, domestic trials, of course, uh, the same issue of immunities arises. So um, failing uh, a major political upset in the regimes of either Russia or Bel Belarus, it seems unlikely that either country will waive um, immunities for high level perpetrators. And essentially this would entail that only lower level perpetrators will be able to uh, be tried before domestic courts for aggression. Now, in terms of what I think is most um, likely to, to happen, and I, you can't see the title, but essentially this is possible solutions in reverse order of 
likelihood, but right order of desirability, and this is from my perspective. Um, I think um, I won't go through the entire slides, but what I'll say is that what I think it's most likely to happen, in my view, is a multi-layered approach to prosecutions uh, based on how high-ranking defendants might be. So similarly to what the ICC and Ukraine are uh, considering for other Rome statute crimes, would the ICC possibly uh, try and hire ranking perpetrators to overcome the immunity obstacle and Ukraine try and lower level perpetrators before uh, domestic courts? I think what's likely to happen with the crime of aggression is that um, Ukraine will carry out some domestic prosecutions for lower level perpetrators as it has done and, and will probably continue to do, and then will pursue option to be, uh, and of course, seek the endorsement of the General Assembly, whether this endorsement is going to be forthcoming, I think it's an open question. Um, but it's, in my view, the most likely case scenario. And to conclude, um, I'd like to advance some policy recommendations, certainly applicable to the US government, but equally to other states seeking to confront Russia's aggression. Um, as we sort out exactly what the right jurisd jurisdictional avenues will be, there is an imperative and urgent need to investigate the crimes today and to preserve that evidence before it is lost or compromised. And those who have heard me speak before know that this is kind of uh, my conclusion to pretty much every single talk about accountability, but it's true. Um, and because at the practical level, investigators are not going to be able to sift through the evidence and only collect and, and gather evidence of one subset of crimes and exclude evidence of, of the crime of aggression, it is important that at the stage, states support all investigations. And that includes not just investigations by Ukrainian authorities, but also those uh, by ICC investigators. Um, in addition, uh, there are other internationally mandated investigations, uh, gathering, collating, and tests to preserve evidence of criminal conduct in Ukraine. And particularly, I'm thinking about the UN Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, which uh, was uh, recently established by the UN Human Rights Council and was given a massive uh, mandate in terms of scope, but was not given, and is still to this day not being given, the infrastructure and the resources to be able to fulfill uh, this mandate. And in fact, uh, at a, at a talk that we just hosted um, about a month ago, one of the commissioners for the Ukraine COI said, we still haven't managed to get off the ground. And even if they were to do so uh, promptly, the question remains as to whether in the mid to long term, they would be able to fulfill the preservation aspect of their mandate if the technical and support and security uh, information security infrastructure is not given to them, similarly to the way it has been given to the IIIM uh, and the mechanis investigative mechanisms for Myanmar and ISIL Daesh. Um, and for those that are interested, we've covered um, some of these challenges and proposed a solution for a standing investigative support mechanism at the UN uh, in a report that I recently co-authored with Ambassador Rapp, uh, among others. Um, I will say two more things. One is it's, uh, we should be clear that enforcing criminal liability uh, and accountability for Russia's aggression is of course crucial because this is, I believe, a watershed moment in, in the history of the world order. But it's not the only way to hold Russia to account. And states can and should pursue other avenues available to them under international law. Uh, for example, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's litigation against Russia before both the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights should be supported and uh, joined uh, by those who can. Uh, Ukraine has also convened a blue ribbon panel to explore and uh, implement international legal mechanisms for compensation for damages caused to Ukraine uh, as a result of Russia's aggression, which I believe is something that uh, should be explored and supported. And there are also other avenues available under human rights law to enforce state accountability for Russia's aggression. In particular, I'm thinking about um, uh, on, the, on the basis of General Comment 36 by the UN Human Rights Committee, every that resulting from uh, Russia's aggression is ipso facto a violation of the right to life under the ICCPR. Meaning, and Russia, by the way, is subject to both interstate complaint procedures as well as individual complaint procedures. So these are avenues that are available to uh, hold, uh, enforce the liability of the Russian state under human, human rights law. And of course, there's other avenues under humanitarian law because that's the will violate human rights law uh, as a result of the Russia uh, invasion of Ukraine would also likely violate um, humanitarian law. And uh, last but not least, 
it is imperative the states remain steadfast, not just in their support of Ukraine's quest for accountability, but also of its defense to repel Russia's aggression, of its reconstruction, and of any future transitional justice strategies that Ukraine may seek to implement. So I think that concludes my remarks for today, and I'm looking forward to uh, your questions and to continuing our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Federica. Uh, Kristen, we're over to you. Right. Um. Okay, I think I've got it up. If, if not, let me know, but otherwise I'll proceed. Okay. Um, so I was asked to talk about protected points and status um, in international humanitarian law and armed conflicts. Uh, before I get started, just the typical disclaimer, I'm speaking on my own behalf and my personal capacity, not on behalf of the ABA today. Um, another kind of disclaimer framing issue, I focused on customary international law and just kind of outlining the the uh, protected points and status that's there. International humanitarian law, as I'm sure most people on this call know, is a huge body of law with lots of treaties and conventions and complications and nuance. So this is just kind of going to be a high level. And then hopefully we can, you know, hear from others during the discussion as well, who might have more experience with the nuances. Um, and as a roadmap, as I said, I'm going to start talking about um, framing principles, uh, like, um, and then move to protected people, civilians and others, protected objects. And then um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how those issues translate to war crimes at the end, just because I'm, I'm mostly an international criminal lawyer and um, I focus a lot in my daily work on the ICC. So I thought that might be interesting. Um, so to start, uh, here's a few framing concepts I just wanted to point out and you'll see how they run through um, the rules on protected people and points in IHL. Uh, the first is distinction. So the obligation to distinguish between military and civilians and military object objectives and civilian objects. Um, the impact of this principle is that it it impacts the way that parties choose the means and method of warfare that they um, that they use. You know, indiscriminate attacks are prohibited. So, using the types of weapons that can't distinguish between civilians and military objectives, or maybe will have a much greater impact that's not controllable and, and therefore will impact civilians. Um, and it also requires parties to then take mitigation measures um, to the extent they can. Uh, another principle is proportionality. So that's the idea that attacks may not cause excessive harm relative to the concrete and direct military objective anticipated. Um, and that principle is reflected in the ICC statutes um, definition of war crimes, that excessive, uh, excessive harm issue. And again, it, it requires parties to take mitigation measures. And then lastly, um, I wanted to mention precaution. So that's the idea that constant care must be taken to spare civilians and other protected persons and points during IHL or during armed conflicts. Um, so feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and minimize incidental loss of civilians and civilian objects, meaning me mitigating measures, warnings, and that'll also impact the means used. Um, so, you know, there, there is the recognition that civilians um, and civilian objects will be lost and damaged during IHL, but it needs to be minimized through precaution and um, taking proportionality in attacks. Uh, second, conflict classification is a big challenge in IHL. And, um, you know, I'm familiar with it in the in international criminal law context because every case then has to start with a conflict classification, whether the conflict is international or non-international. They have to reach a certain level of hostility um, and, and violence in order to co constitute an armed conflict. And so it's just always a challenge and different rules apply based on what type of conflict it is, a little bit at least. And then lastly, war crimes, of course, there's um, the ICC statute uses serious violations of the laws and customs of war applicable in armed conflict. And there's also kind of the idea of the grave breaches can, um, regime. Uh, war crimes focus on protected persons or values um, in, in their seriousness, like values might be like torture, ensuring fair trial rights, um, uh, 
And there's grave breaches is defined at the end in the, a piece of the Rome statute I pulled if you're interested in that. Okay, so to get started, um, the, the most core protected people in, in armed conflict are civilians, of course. So they're defined negatively as uh, not members of the armed forces in customary international law. There's also definitions in the additional protocols. Um, that's what AP refers to in this. Uh, so not members of the armed forces or militias or um, a levy on mass, which is when civilians kind of uh, resist without having time to form a militia in a very uh, short definition. Um, I also included, you know, a bit kind of a definition from the US uh, Commander's Handbook on the law of naval operations. It, you can see the principles um, mentioned filter into that definition and then what is required to protect civilians. And then the presumption is that um, a protected person is a civilian. So when in doubt, they should be treated with civilian status rather than assumed that they're a combatant. Uh, and the impact, of course, this requires parties to do things like remove civilian persons and objects from the vicinity of military objectives. Uh, the use of human shields is prohibited. That'll be on a later slide. And then you know, things like prohibiting forced displacement unless it's for civilian security, such as to evacuate them from something that's become, going to become a military target. Um, there's lots of additional rules on protecting the rights and treatments of civilians, like preventing torture, sexual violence, um, arbitrary detention, et cetera. And uh, I, I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't mention that attacks on civilians, while they can constitute war crimes, certainly can also constitute international crimes if they're widespread and systematic, which would be crimes against humanity, or committed with the intent to destroy the population, which would be genocide. So we can always talk about those issues more in Q&A. Um, they lose their protection when, uh, unless and for such time, they take a direct part in hostilities. So taking a direct part in hostilities um, is the key issue. And unfortunately, it's not clearly defined in treaties. Um, in the Rome Statute, it's not defined, or according at least to the ICRC and customary international law. So I included a few examples of uh, the way an international um, uh, international entity and then like the U.S. manuals have dealt with this issue. So the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights um, in a report on Colombia from 1999 examining that armed conflict talked about uh, direct participation as meaning acts which by their nature or purpose are intended to cause actual harm to enemy personnel and material. So they're, they were dealing um, with a situation where armed forces were equating civilian political support and things like selling goods to the to enemy forces to supporting um, you know, the armed forces and treating them as combatants and therefore not distinguishing between civilians and uh, enemy military forces. So, you know, they go through some examples of what direct support might be and what shouldn't count as direct support, like merely supporting the adverse party's war or military effort or um, selling goods to the armed parties, expressing sympathy and, and those issues. Here's an example from the United States. Uh, they say taking a direct part in hostilities extends beyond merely engaging in combat, including acts that are an integral part of combat operations or effectively and substantially contributing to an adverse party's adversary's ability to conduct or sustain combat operations. And then they give some examples as well. Obviously taking up arms seems like a pretty clear example of when a civilian turns into, loses their protection, um, does not include general support to the state's war effort or uh, transmitting propaganda. And crucially, this is a really fact dependent analysis. So they suggest it might include consideration of the person's behavior, location, attire, um, and then their proximity to actual combat in making that determination of if a civilian has lost their status. And then here's another example, the Law of War Manual uh, from the 2016 update gives a list, uh, the non-exhaustive list of what might be participating in hostilities versus not taking a direct part in hostilities. So again, sympathy or moral support for the cause, independent journalism or public advocacy, shouldn't be counted as uh, taking part in hostilities and then medical care, which is another category of protected persons. 
Um, all right, and then the, the issue of human shields is one that comes up often in terms of uh, civilians and their protection. It's uh, defined as using the presence or movement of civilians or other protected persons to make certain points or areas or a group of military forces immune from attack or operations. So uh, this was dealt with in, in some cases at the ICTY. Um, and then I also included an example from the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's report on the first month of the armed conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine because there have been allegations of um, Russian troops using human shields um, and then you know, some, some confusion about what it actually means. I think the, the clearest case is when in a party moves civilians in order to protect or hides with them, in them intentionally. Um, you know, there, there's also the issue then of whether they've given time to evacuate civilians, given warning that something might become a military objective, but it's definitely a practical issue that filters into armed conflict and protection. So then other protected people, other than civilians um, include all of these, medical personnel, uh, uh, and that's related to the protection of the wounded and sick that flows throughout many of the Geneva Conventions. Um, they lose their protection if they commit outside their humanitarian function acts harmful to the enemy. So, and then um, customary international law and uh, various con conventions give some examples like caring for the wounded and sick of, of the enemy, you know, the person, the, the side, the medical personnel is working with is not a hostile act, um, nor is carrying small arms to defend oneself and patients uh, or, or when taken from a patient temporarily. Um, but uh, that can get a little complicated, you know, if they use them against the enemy or to try to escape, uh, it gets more complicated, so. Um, and then also persons displaying the distinctive emblem of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. Uh, and, you know, that that emblem is not necessary to confer protected status, but it does help identify a party as one of these protected people or or an object in the in the um, example of like a military unit. So religious personnel similarly lose their protection when they um, engage in harmful acts to the enemy outside their humanitarian um, function. And then journalists have the same protection as civilians because they are civilians, but they're kind of specially um, iterated in the convention just in, in custom just as a reminder. So uh, they must be respected and protected as long as they're not taking a direct part in hostilities um, and or take action adversely affecting their status, like engaging in hostilities, I think the customary international law database also gives the example of um, entering territory illegally in order to, to be a journalist as an example that might complicate status. Um, humanitarian relief personnel, of course, are protected and that relates to um, the issue of preventing starvation of civilians, protecting the wounded and sick and distinguishing between civilians and the impact on them and military objectives. Peacekeeping personnel, similarly, um, treated as civilians as long as they're not taking an active part in hostilities. The nuance there is that it excludes forces engaged in peace enforcement operations who um, can be considered as combatants and required to respect international humanitarian law with all the other parties to the conflict. And then um, also, lastly, of course, people who are uh, were combatants but are out of combat because they're wounded or sick defenseless, um, you know, shipwrecked, or who's clearly in, in expressed an intention to surrender. And they likewise lose status if they re-engage in hostilities. Um, but it notes that violence against these people should be preceded by a warning. And then uh, moving to objects, these are kind of the biggest and clearest uh, ones that come up most often, I would say. So civilian objects, of course, should be protected just like civilians. Parties must again distinguish between military and civilian objects at all times and attacks can't be directed against civilian objects. As I mentioned, there are other rules in IHL um, about precautions necessary to avoid or limit incidental civilian damage and uh, objects lose protection if they're used to make an effective contribution to military action 
and for such time as they become military objectives. So it is possible for a civilian object to become a military objective. Uh, but again, that would be a, a fact dependent inquiry. And um, I included, again, some examples of this in the Ukraine conflict dr um, drawn from the OSCE report. They focus one on attacks on schools um, and they say, you know, this, this kind of highlights the nuances. Um, schools are civilian objects and have to be treated as such, even in case of doubt, whether they're used for military purposes. In addition, even when targeting a school that has turned into a military objective, or a nearby target, meaning this would be incidental damage, the presence of children who remain civilians has to be taken into account in the proportionality evaluation. So, you know, the, the, uh, it's um, assumed that they're civilian objects, but again, it's possible that something like that could turn into a military objective. And then um, a, a really clear example is the, that we're probably all familiar with is the attack on the Mariupol theater which was, um, is that image where I think children is written in white outside of the theater and civilians were hiding in the basement and the theater seemed to be directly attacked. Um, so, you know, the OSCE report said that that is an egregious violation of IHL and those who ordered or executed it committed a war crime. And uh, medical units and um, transports are protective are protected when they're exclusively assigned to medical purposes. Uh, they lose their protection, again, if they're being used outside their humanitarian function. Uh, and then there's some examples from the Geneva Conventions themselves, like when medical units are used to shelter combatants, store arms, um, or from state practice when they're used, the equipment is used to collect or transmit military intelligence. That's the kind of thing that can lose them protection uh, and then before attacking a medical unit that has lost protection, a warning setting a reasonable time limit should be issued. So again, that's the, the principle of precaution filtering in. And uh, some examples, again, there, the OSCE report outlines many verified attacks, uh, verified incidents of attacks, destruction, or looting of medical units in the Ukraine conflict. Um, and it says, even assuming that some attacks were directed against facilities engaged in acts harmful to the enemy or incidentally harmed by, against, by attacks against legitimate targets, this cannot explain the large number of affected facilities. And also saying that um, Russia didn't institute warnings in all but one circumstance. So I think they're getting at a pattern of attack against medical units, not as incidental damage to legitimate military targets. Um, and then another clear example, of course, is the attack on the Mary Pohl Maternity House and Children's Hospital, which is, was the source of really horrific images um, reported in the media. And, you know, they say that's a clear violation of IHL and those responsible have committed a war crime. So, you know, corresponding, um, we're nearing the end here, but corresponding to uh, the, protect, the protected people, peacekeeping objects are also protected. Um, and then certain areas are protected, uh, some because they're civilian, like um, towns and villages and other undefended places. So, you know, anything that's not a military objective. And as I said, it can lose protection from attack when those uh, requirements fall away, like when troops are overwhelmingly present or the population engages in hostile acts um, supporting military operations and they can be occupied and that's the idea of military necessity but you know all those same protections would still come into play about precaution protecting civilians giving them time to evacuate allowing them to evacuate and all those issues and then other specific zones demilitarized demilitarized zones hospital and safety zones or neutralized zones places that are established specifically to protect um, people from the effects of conflict and then lastly, in terms of objects, I just wanted to highlight one as an example. Uh, cultural property is protected in international humanitarian law, again, because it's a civilian object, but it also uh, has its uh, custom and, and treaties say that special care should be taken to avoid damage to these types of objects and buildings because they're of great importance to cultural heritage. And, uh, I think an, an example of this in Ukraine would be 
the damage to the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center, which occurred during strikes on a nearby TV tower in Kiev. So, um, you know, I think that was that was a complex. The TV tower was nearby, but it it was the um, it was struck directly and damaged. And then there's also been reporting about, um, as an example of how to try to prevent this or minimize this, there's been a lot of reporting about Ukraine, Ukrainian efforts to move their museum and art collections to safer places. And, you know, I've seen lots of photos of protecting um, cultural monuments with sandbags and fireproof material to make them less likely to be struck or to protect them from incidental damage. Um, and then how this translate to, translates to war crimes, uh, you know, cultural property is protected and then when it's violated, it, it can become a war crime. So um, I just, since I'm an international criminal lawyer, uh, the ICC Office of the Prosecutor has a specific policy on cult cultural heritage um, issued in 2021. It kind of describes their approach to the issue and that they're making it a priority. And then this has come into fruition in two cases in Mali. Um, one is the Al Mahdi case, which has already been final. Um, he pled guilty and he was convicted of the war crime of intentionally directing attacks against buildings dedicated to religious and historic monuments. Um, there's a quote from prosecutor Ben Suda saying how important it was and symbolic um, to the local community and the international community as a whole to protect these, these types of objects. And then there's a photo courtesy of UNESCO of one of the destroyed um, buildings being rebuilt by uh, the local population. And then there's also the Al Hassan case, which is currently in trial. So no conviction in that necessarily, but um, He's alleged to have deliberately attacked cultural heritage in Timbuktu, and that's also kind of part of the underlying crimes, according to the ICC prosecutor that they're pursuing. So that's how, you know, one of those protections is translating into accountability. And then to, to finish off, I just included some examples. As I said, um, not all IHL violations translate to being war crimes necessarily, but um, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as an example, has war crimes in Article 8. Uh, there's kind of several groups, depending on which type of conflict it is, uh, non-international or international. The first grouping, you'll see um, war crimes means, and then they have grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, namely any of the following acts against persons or property protected. Uh, so willful killing, um, torture, extensive destruction, uh, and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity. So you'll see like willfulness is a big part of making a violation against protected points or persons into a war crime. Um, so those are some examples. And then here are some, this is not even all of them, but in section B is those focused on uh, the laws and customs of war applicable in international armed conflicts. So this is a conflict between two states. And so, you know, some examples intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population or against individual civilians, not taking direct part in hostilities. And intention here's one where all of those um, framing principles come into play, intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that such attack will cause incidental loss of life or injury to civilians. Um, or widespread long-term severe damage to the natural environment, which would be clearly excessive in relation to the concrete and direct overall military advantage anticipated. So if you're prosecuting a crime like this in an international tribunal, you'd have to you know, explain all of those issues. Intent, of course, would be really important. Um, the, the injury to civilians and then the excessive nature and the military advantage anticipated. So it turns into quite an inqu inquiry. Um, and then I highlighted starvation of civilians as a method of warfare at the bottom because that's been a recent discussion um, at the ICC level and I think filters into the Russia-Ukraine conversation as well right now. And then, um, I'm sorry, I didn't get these slides ahead of time, but um, hopefully we can share them after. I just, this is my, my sources and some, um, some resources for further reading. You know, there's been a lot of reporting, obviously, about the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the, um, the issue of war crimes. 
So there's some great online symposiums. I use examples from the OSCE report um, and New York Times reporting as well. So thank you so much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kristen. I'm just going to, I will truncate some of what I had to, to say, but in any event, I, I tend to look at a lot of what we're seeing and experiencing in the international criminal law arena through the optic of US experience in Bosnia and the Balkans, probably more broadly. When you think about the deluge of atrocity-related information that arrives each day from Ukraine and compare it to where we were 100 plus days into the conflict in Bosnia, I, I find the difference just staggering. At this point in that conflict, we were still trying to figure out basic patterns and relationships, and the amount of really reliable information that we had at our disposal was, I would argue, very limited. By contrast, the sheer number of efforts underway to collect information about violations of the laws of armed conflict in Ukraine is just staggering. Not only that, but in a broader sense, the past 100 plus days has witnessed a complete about face in the global narrative about international criminal law, human rights, norms, and related areas. Whereas as recently as last December, people were still penning books and articles with titles like the end times of human rights and senior politicians here and abroad were insisting that these issues no longer had salience. These topics are now at the heart of everyday discourse, find it across social media, radio, and, and the printed press. There are many ways in which the situation in Ukraine and Ukrainian legal capacity are very different from what transpired in Bosnia. <clears throat> but I also think that at least a small part of the response can be attributed to several of my formal colleagues who, after leaving government, initiated a significant number of international criminal law programs at various law schools, and has spent the past 20 years producing a whole generation of lawyers and investigators who are steeped in these questions, and I would argue are rising to the occasion. And notably, these former students include a large number of female lawyers and investigators, which back at the in the early 90s were in such short supply. There are other former colleagues who have con continued to push for international accountability and innovative approaches to international justice, really in the face of strong opposition, both in the US and abroad. I find this attention and how much work is being done simply astounding. So what are some of the challenges associated with overlapping jurisdictions and multiple investigatory efforts, which are taking place at a national bilateral NGO and civilian level? The first challenge I see is the possibility of different investigatory teams literally tripping all over one another, barring a very strong coordinating hand. I sometimes have this image in my head of a five-year-old soccer team with everyone trying to get the ball. Perhaps under the circumstances, we might better approach this by envisaging this as sort of a phase four element of a military operation and assign, assign teams to specific military districts. Commanders of those military districts would also be responsible for the team's logistical support on-site security, secure communications, et cetera. The second challenge I see is which jurisdiction and what law is going to apply to in which circumstances. It is inevitable that regardless of how many separate judicial processes are initiated, it's just not going to be possible to try all the potential perpetrators. Gaining custody of senior leaders, as Federica has already pointed out, will be especially difficult. I don't think there's going to be a big problem in this context as we've had in the past finding interpreters. 
but with the ICC, the UN, multiple countries, international and domestic NGOs, and individuals all gathering information, the end product is likely to reside in several languages and will need to be translated. That requirement, along with um, that requirement alone, will require substantial computing power. Surely it would be best if interviews could be conducted against an agreed set of questions and responses taken down in an agreed format, but I suspect that will take an enormous amount of effort to achieve and might in the end be a bridge too far. Similarly, it would simplify matters down the road if a good number of these efforts could all use the same information management system, but that too may prove too difficult. And it's not just the volume of information that is sort of formidable in comparison to Bosnia. It's the additional types of information, multiple types of social media, extensive commercial satellite imagery, ubiquitous cell phone footage, um, more readily available order of battle information, and their ability to be spoofed in an age of mega disinformation and malinformation that is adding complexity to what is already a complex undertaking. You're going to need other types of forensic specialists, data scientists, and others to help you sift and verify the information that is available. You'll also have to undertake more aggressive efforts to keep the information that is collected secure. Bosnia took place during a time when many of us were just getting used to having a computer on our desks and exploring how to crunch data. It really was only after we began creating some rudimentary databases that it was possible to begin making the case that the violence that we were seeing was more than spontaneous. It seems to me that the only way that investigators will be able to make sense of the volume and variety of information that is being gathered in Ukraine will be through the extensive application of advanced artificial intelligence. But that in itself may pose challenges. Advanced AI frequently reaches solutions that the average human mind can't follow. There are just too many moving parts in all of this. But if we can't understand how the answer has been reached, how can you make a case in court? And what are the implications of employing these types of tools for equality of arms? There are any number of other observations that might be made, but I think I, I'm just going to stop here and and open the floor to to questions. Um, 